afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you're feeling chipper after an evening of uh, festivities. Um, so my name is Simon, co-founder of Eco Navi, which I created with my friend Breno, who's a farmer in Brazil. It's a platform that maps and supports agroforestry and land restoration projects in Brazil. Since launching, we've onboarded over 700 field projects. Um, and with early Web3 revenue, we've supported some planting projects and educational workshops and produced some impact reports. Now, I don't, I'm not here to pitch my startup. Uh, what I really want to focus on is um, sharing some insights from the field so we can think about it and effectively make a viable solution for uh, tokenization of land regeneration in Brazil and beyond. So we uh, launched in December 2020 basically as a um, social media for agroforestry. A couple months in, we went down the Web3 rabbit hole and find ourselves interacting with people in the refi community, regenerative finance. Um, arguably, the holy grail, if you will, is a solution where financial outcomes are reflected in uh, nature, yeah, natural outcomes. And so to get there, the, it can be boiled down to two questions. How can blockchain stimulate climate action? And which Web3 communities, existing or potential, will have the most climate and regenerative impact and thus be best positioned to create value in a token? So now to get into it, we'll start with some definitions. First, taken from the XRPL glossary, the process of converting real-world assets or rights into digital tokens on a blockchain or distributed ledger system. Digital tokens represent ownership or access rights to the underlying physical or digital assets, and they can be bought, sold, or traded like cryptocurrencies. In our case, the real-world assets pertain to nature, what is planted, produced, and the environmental indicators around that. And uh, if you recall David Schwartz's keynote from yesterday, it is uh, increasingly a norm and being used in uh, the mainstream. Next. Regeneration, an approach to designing systems or solutions that aim to work with or mimic natural ecosystem processes for returning energy from less usable to more usable forms, to create resilient and equitable systems that integrate the needs of society with the integrity of nature. So in blockchain reflects well what refi is about. And finally, Brazil, it's a country, 215 million inhabitants, 8.5 million square kilometers fifth most populous and fifth largest by surface area. With respect to geography, it's clearly at the forefront of uh, climate action and climate challenges. We all know about the importance of protecting the Amazon, but if you look at the light green and yellow sections along the Atlantic coast, that also once was a rainforest of comparable size to the Amazon and gradually cut down with the arrival of the Portuguese in the 16th century. And today, the Atlantic forest, Mata Atlantica, no more than 15% of its original cover remains. So as far as regenerative work, we have it cut out for us. Now, when we talk about you know, climate action and such, it's largely expressed in terms of carbon. Climate change is caused by carbon emissions. Um, stabilization would be brought by reducing our footprint and um, carbon uh, capturing, most simply expressed through planting trees. It's obviously a little chaotic. There's issues of credibility of data and compliance. But I also want to share something that we've encountered when it comes, like a constraint with respect to the field. When uh, quote unquote traditional carbon credit emitters come to us to say that they want to plant and capture carbon, they'll say like, okay, you plant trees, we give you 10 to 12 bucks per tree, and you keep it for 25 to 30 years and you don't do too much with it. On the surface, okay, it could be compelling. You know, plant 5,000 trees, that's uh, 50 grand. For a Brazilian farmer, that, that's pretty good money. However, because of the constraints that you can't do too much with it and keep it for 25 to 30 years, more than half of uh, their professional career, the farmer, especially smallholder farmers with limited land, can become like a slave to the contract. So, to come up with a carbon methodology and legitimize it that focuses, say, on additionality and maybe annual outcomes would be much more favorable 
to the Brazilian smallholder farmer, which is the most prone to take on these kind of contracts. Because unlike the big monoculture businesses that plant soybeans for miles on end, uh, spoiler alert, not very sustainable, the smallholder farmers are more likely to adapt innovative methods like agroforestry or have biodiverse inputs in what they're planting. And when you look at the bigger picture throughout Brazil, it's actually a, a compelling market. About 77% of agricultural properties are smallholder or family farms. 70% of Brazilian food that they domestically consume comes from smallholder farming, which, when taken from the source, represents, it's a conservative estimate, $11 billion per year. This doesn't even count what is exported, which is also in the billions. It employs 10 million people in Brazil, so that's roughly 10% of Brazil's workforce, and they cover 800, over 800,000 square kilometers of land. That's France and the UK combined. Now, uh, when you look at the context of Brazil, it's quite favorable to uh, in, um, innovative initiatives. By the end of the year, they're gonna launch the CBDC, Digital Real, on an EVM chain, so XRPL's sidechain is coming at the right time. Um, and it's also one of the first countries to emit green bonds in the framework of the Climate Bonds Initiative, $2 billion worth of it. So now, can we imagine a token that is a state-backed asset that's workable for Brazil's field actors from north, south, the coast to the Amazon that will be stimulating land and biodiversity restoration quickly. I'm talking three years, four years, not like decades. And finally, supports sustainable agriculture and is, becomes the basis of a circular economy. And furthermore, what can XRPL take from this? Just an hour ago, there was a workshop on um, how to make the XRP ledger more sustainable. And it is uh, uh, already energy efficient as it is, but um, there's some things that we can take into consideration. One is you know, the, the offsetting, but a preference for carbon avoidance. When it comes to the field, this can be simply done by good practices and a good balance between agriculture and nature. Um, and one other thing is that offsetting is Inevitable, inevitable, so we have to, to contribute there and work with the field. And so that means working with these people. These are the faces of uh, land regeneration, and whichever blockchain, XRPL or otherwise, works with them, they will be the ones most impactful, remembered for it, and also the winners of a regenerative economy. And I want to share just one more thought. Carbon, carbon capture, it's important, but ultimately, it's really a means to an end. You know, we can be happy for capturing however many thousands of tons of carbon, but what really matters is how that's reflected in the real world. So to say that we capture thousands of tons of carbon, great, but let's see it happen like this. Going from simple, degraded, barren land to abundant and biodiverse forest, such as the work done here by a member of our network. He's an agroforestry magician, Huch Sonanawa, this is what we're focusing on, and if you want to compensate in such a framework and develop a token with us, I'm happy to speak with you later. Thank you very much. Yeah.